Thank you all for being here. It is 1230 and I'm going to open up with introductions and um, introduce our speaker. We are so excited um, to begin our Women's History Program 2023 speaker. My name is Tina Lining and I am the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusive Excellence here in the School of Medicine at Case Western Reserve University. And um, on behalf of Dean Gerson and our four other campuses, which includes the Cleveland Clinic Foundation, a University Hospitals, the Veteran Affairs Medical Center, and the Metro Health Center, um, we certainly, Metro Health System, excuse me, we certainly welcome you all here. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker in the person of Dr. Sharita Hill Golden. She is the Hugh P. McCormick Family Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism and Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine. She holds joint appointments in the Welch Center for Prevention, Epidemiology, and the Clinical Research in the Departments of Epidemiology at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and in the Armstrong Institute for Patient Safety and Quality. An internationally recognized physician scientist and member of the National Academy of Medicine, the Association of American Physicians and American Society of Clinical Investigation, Dr. Golden's research has been used as tools of epidem for epidemiology and health services, research to identify biological systems contributors to disparities in type 2 diabetes and its outcomes. She is the author of more than 250 articles that focus on diabetes, endocrinology, and other health disparities. In order to more directly address the root causes of health inequities identified through her research, Dr. Golden has used her executive leadership roles to develop systems, communities, and policy interventions as an inaugural executive vice chair of Department of Medicine at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. She launched a department-wide civic engagement initiative resulting in programs that address community-related concerns, enhanced employee engagement following Baltimore's civil unrest surrounding the 2015 death of Freddie Gray, in her current role as Vice President and Chief Diversity Officer for Johns Hopkins Medicine, she oversees diversity, inclusion, and health equity strategies and operations for the School of Medicine and Johns Hopkins Health Center. Without further ado, it is indeed my honor and privilege to introduce to uh, uh, Dr. Sharita Hill Golden as our 2023 Women's History Speaker. Welcome, Dr. Hill Golden. Dr. Hill Golden. Welcome. I am so excited to have you. You've been mentoring me from afar. <laughs> so thank you for your generous introduction. It was so exciting. I'm just trying to get the slides lined up right. It was so exciting to be able to meet and talk with you in person as we were preparing. Yes. It sounds like Case Western School of Medicine is in very excellent and capable hands. So, um, so thank you for inviting me. And I think what I want to do this afternoon is tell you a little bit about my background and how all the pieces of my background fit together to what I do currently. And then since it is Women's History Month, sort of share um, Black women leaders in medicine and health that have inspired me. And then, and then kind of end with why is it important to have um, intersectional leadership um, in our current time to achieve health equity. So I'm going to call this leveraging the power of intersectional women leaders to achieve health equity. Um, so I thought it would be helpful to start out with a little bit of my um, journey, and Tina and I talked about this a bit. So um, I consider that a, a big part of my journey started with my maternal grandmother, who was born um, in Louisa County, Virginia, which is a small place between um, a rural community between Charlottesville and Richmond, Virginia. And just to give you context, she was born in 1914. So um, when she was um, a teenager, she left uh, Louisa County at the age of 13 because there weren't opportunities for African-Americans um, in the South and Jim Crow was running rampant um, after the reconstruction area. And so she um, relocated up to Washington, DC. And in fact, the first place that my husband and I found her um, in Maryland was in a, a place called Hartford County, Maryland, which is up here. And we went on ancestry.com and found her at age 16. She was um, a, um, a nanny and a cook for a white family. 
and the head of that um, household was, um, he was a, um, in the military and got relocated to Washington, D.C. So that's how my grandmother ended up in Washington, D.C. And so her home in Washington became the conduit through which all of her siblings came up to um, the Maryland, D.C. area. And then my father's uh, family, and so this is my maternal grandmother and my grandfather years later, obviously. My grandfather's roots were in Raleigh, North Carolina. So similarly, he came up um, to the D.C. area looking for more opportunities. And then uh, my father's family is from um, a place called St. Mary's County, Maryland, which is a Southern rural Maryland. And again, everybody sort of was coming to this area in Washington looking for better opportunities. Um, so my, um, my mom and dad actually um, met at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School um, in Washington, DC, which was the first black public high school um, for African-Americans um, in the country. Um, there's a really great book um, about it called First Class, if you wanna read. Um, these are pictures, I love these pictures of them when they were um, teenagers um, at Dunbar um, and they um, graduated and got married in 1953. So they've been together for a very long time. Um, but I wasn't born until 1968. And the reason that that's relevant is um, I was born on March 21st, 1968. So had a birthday about a week ago, um, but I was born two weeks of the day before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And so if you'll remember, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. So I feel like I have lived my entire um, lived experience in the aftermath of all of that. So this is Washington, D.C., a place called H Street, um, which was a very popular shopping hub, a very um, upscale area, not that far from where my grandmother lived. And after um, the unrest in 1968, this is what H Street looked like. And it really didn't get built back up to its original until about 2012. So, um, you know, there are lots of other parts of my journey, but for the sake of time, I will start in college. I went to the University of Maryland um, College Park. I was a first generation college student. Um, neither of my parents went to college. They went and worked for the federal government. Um, and I had a love for science early on. So I was one of those little girls with a microscope and a Barbie doll. That's just kind of, and my parents went with that and supported me in that. Um, but, um, but these are pictures when I graduated from college, which for my grandmother, the one who come up from Louisa County, Virginia was a very proud moment because um, you know, that was the first on our side of the family. And then there's three women here, um, black women, and they all had an influence on me because we were a part of the same um, sorority. And while I was an undergrad at the University of Maryland, I pledged um, Delta Sigma Theta um, Sorority Incorporated. And the reason I was so inspired by that, that particular organization is that um, the women um, in that organization they founded it in 1913 specifically to march for the women's suffrage movement. So um, that was their first act of public service. And I was really inspired by that. So not only would they march in the women's suffrage movement where because they were black women, they were put in the back and spat upon and not even really included, but they would subsequently go on along with the other Divine Nine organizations to march in multiple uh, civil rights movements to get to where we are today. Um, so I went from the University of Maryland to the University of Virginia. Now, this is a little bit ironic because if you remember, my grandmother was leaving Virginia, come up to Washington to give us a better opportunity. And literally when I said, I really like UVA, I like the environment there. And I thought, think I want to go there for medical school. My grandmother literally put her hand on her hip and said, I cannot believe you are going back to Virginia. I tried to get all of you all out of Virginia, but I had to convince her that the hospitals were no longer segregated that um, if there wasn't the same degree of oppression, I was like, and they're offering you like a full scholarship. And she got, she kind of got excited by that. And so this is one of my favorite pictures of the two of us because it was taken the day before my first day of medical school at UVA. And we had just walked out of the front door of the new UVA hospital, unsegregated, nobody bothered us. And I was grateful she was able to take that journey with me. Um, so while I was in, um, while I was in medical school, I, I went there to be a pediatrician. That's a whole nother talk I could give, but actually fell in love with the care of people with diabetes. And my internal medicine attending, Dr. Eugene Darrett, who I'm still in touch with, was really the first person that even got me to think about, you should consider a career in academic medicine because you ask a lot of questions that don't have an answer. I had never really thought of it before then, to be quite honest. And, you know, um, as a part of my, my journey, the first, um, patient that I ever saw was um, a 35-year-old man with um, type 1 diabetes. This was my second year of medical school, and he was legally blind, had end-stage renal disease. He already had um, toe amputations and had such severe um, hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia unawareness 
that he'd been in two motor vehicle accidents and had his license revoked. So, I mean, he really had like every disabling complication of diabetes. And um, he had had a kidney transplant and was um, when I did my history and physical on him. Um, and, and you might think that that seemed like, gosh, what a difficult um, scenario. But before I graduated from UVA in the fall of 1999, when I was doing my internal medicine sub I, um, the results of the diabetes control and complications trial was published. And it showed that if you tightly controlled um, blood sugar, that you could present, prevent all of the devastating complications that that young man had. So I knew that I would have the tools um, to really improve the outcome um, and lives of people with, um, with diabetes. And then in addition, it was a growing public health epidemic. Um, I didn't know that today there'd be 37 million Americans with diabetes. And it was particularly impacting um, non-white communities, so African-American communities, indigenous communities, South Asian communities, Hispanic communities, all people of color. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to be a part of, um, of being able to help improve outcomes for those communities as well. So I came to Johns Hopkins um, in 1994 to start my internship in internal medicine. Um, this is clearly an old picture, um, but, but there I am right there. There were five black women in my internship class. Um, and, uh, you know, and that was the most that they had ever had in an internship class. So um, fairly um, re rem remarkable at the time. Um, so I came to Hopkins, did not intend to still be here, but here I still am almost 29 years later. Um, and one of the reasons I ended up staying here is because I was very interested in um, in public health aspects of diabetes and epidemiology. Um, I also, though, really was interested in diabetes and the molecular aspect of endocrinology. And it's like, how can I really merge those things, those interests that seem so eclectic um, into a career? So I sort of joke that this is the place where I married my love of all of those things. I got, during my endocrine fellowship, I got a master's um, of, of um, of health sciences and clinical epidemiology, and I already was receiving the molecular endocrine training. So this is kind of where everything came together. And so not only did I marry um, endocrinology and molecular endocrinology, diabetes, and all of those things, but I also met and married my husband, Dr. Christopher Golden, um, right at the start of my endocrine fellowship. So a lot of things went on once I got here to Johns Hopkins. Um, but you know, as an endocrinologist, I became very interested in how clinical and subclinical hypercortisolism could lead to a risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So um, a lot of you with a, a medical background will may recognize that this woman has Cushing syndrome. I learned a lot about that during my endocrine fellowship. And it, it's either it, it results in over secretion of cortisol due to a pituitary tumor or an adrenal gland tumor. And one of the hallmark features is that um, individuals with this disease gain weight, typically in a central area, and they develop um, type 2 diabetes. Um, we can also see the same Cushing syndrome um, when people take high-dose steroids for, say, an inflammatory condition, or um, if they take steroids to maintain an organ transplant. The same thing can happen. You can get um, type 2 diabetes from the steroids after transplant. So we know that like um, overt high levels of cortisol can lead to that. But I was very interested in what about subclinical hypercortisolism? Um, how do we assess this? And is there evidence that it could be associated with diabetes? And the one place when I was doing my clinical training that I would often see this is that people with depression in particular were prone to have um, an abnormal um, cortisol test response. Um, and there was a reason for that because whenever we um, experience any kind of stress, so I always use the stress of being chased by a bear. Um, if you're being chased by a bear, then um, you know, your body basically um, releases a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone. It stimulates your pituitary gland to release another hormone called ACTH, and that stimulates your adrenal glands to secrete um, cortisol. So what happens is all your glucose stays in the blood, so you can use it for energy. Um, you know, when you're stressed like that, being chased by a bear, your other endocrine systems shut down because you don't need to be reproducing or growing while you're trying to escape from a bear. But this is a tightly regulated feedback loop so that once you've stopped being chased by the bear, then, um, then all of that should shut down. So the bear is gone, you've escaped. So now the cortisol tells your pituitary gland and your hypothalamus, okay, I don't need any more cortisol, shut this down. I don't need my adrenaline system on overdrive. So we've escaped the bear. But what happens is that people who experience chronic stress, like depression or other kinds of emotional stress, 
they have this hyperactivity of this axis all the time. So it never completely shuts off, which means that their sympathetic nervous system or their adrenaline system also is sort of chronically overactivated and the two systems stimulate one another. So that leads not only to high levels of cortisol, but also high levels of adrenaline and high levels of an inflammatory marker called interleukin-6, which um, then stimulates a whole um, cascade of inflammatory hormones. And all of those lead to insulin resistance, and they can ultimately lead to type 2 diabetes. So I will tell you, I started some of this work because I was convinced and still am that some of the, the chronic stressors that minoritized and marginalized communities have experienced over generations you know, is one of the things that contributes to the higher risk of metabolic diseases that we see in our community. So I, you know, I joke that um, my husband teases me because he says all your endocrine glands have all these hormones, but I basically, the hormones that I have focused on are some of those stress hormones in the adrenal gland um, over the course of my career. So there are the adrenal gland hormones, the stress hormone, um, that, so that's the sugar, that's what makes us more prone to diabetes. And then there's another hormone, a set of hormones um, called aldosterone that control our salt and water balance. And then there's another part of that gland that controls our sex hormones. So, um, so one of the first things I looked at was the relationship between depression and diabetes, because I was like, well, is there really a relationship between the two? And one of my earliest studies in the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis that was published in JAMA showed that, in fact, if you have depression, you're at higher risk over time of developing type 2 diabetes. And that's even if you control for those inflammatory markers I talked about, differences in physical activity, eating habits, and body weight. But then if you have diabetes, you also have a higher risk of developing depression. So there's actually a bi-directional relationship between the two. Um, and because I was very interested in the hormone aspect of depression leading to diabetes, um, I was interested in how do you measure that cortisol response in humans. So in, in animals, this has been shown in mice, that if they overexpress cortisol, which these two mice on the right do, you can see that these mice are heavier than the ones that don't overexpress cortisol. And so I, I was like, but we can't, we can't knock out genes in humans, so how do we measure this in humans? So what we did is um, we actually collected saliva samples in um, a subgroup of participants in the MESA study so that we could characterize their cortisol profile over time. And um, with the six, several of my mentees have shown that um, the diurnal cortisol profile is blunted in the setting of type two diabetes, um, that um, while um, that cortisol profile predicts the development of diabetes, diabetes by itself doesn't predict how the cortisol curve changes over time. And then um, also demonstrated that there is evidence that this cortisol curve results in more exposure to cortisol over time and people with diabetes who have more hyperglycemia and more insulin resistance. So again, suggesting that those with diabetes that's uncontrolled are exposed to more cortisol over time, which is like a vicious cycle. And then in thinking about the salt, so one of my very smart mentees, Dr. Joshua Joseph at Ohio State, when he was a fellow with me, did a lot of work showing, well, even the aldosterone in our body that we thought controlled just mainly our salt and water balance and blood pressure is also a risk factor for developing type 2 diabetes. It might explain some of the link between the higher prevalence of type 2 diabetes and, um, and hypertension in African Americans. And then um, also with um, other mentees, have shown that the sex hormones in the adrenal gland are associated with um, higher estrogen and higher testosterone, particularly in the postmenopausal period, are associated with more insulin resistance um, in postmenopausal women. So that was um, kind of how I married my endocrinology and interest in um, molecules and diabetes risk. But one of the other things that, um, that I was asked to do not too long after I had joined the faculty was to start our hospital's inpatient glucose management program um, because um, they were noticing that there were some patients who had a higher length of stay, and particularly patients with diabetes seem to have a higher length of stay attributable to diabetes. And one of the things that became clear to me and my team as we were starting on that journey is that we did not have policies in our hospital that govern how we treat um, hospitalized patients who come in with diabetes, like they're vulnerable and they come into the hospital and we take some of their insulin away when we shouldn't and we feed them differently than what they eat at home and various things happen. 
So we went to the literature to see what are the evidence-based approaches to maintaining good glucose and safe glucose control in the hospital. Um, so over the course of about two years, we um, launched a glucose um, management committee for Johns Hopkins Hospital. We developed system-wide policies, hospital-wide policies to treat hypo and hyperglycemia. We also um, started a diabetes nursing super user program to train our nurses on, uh, on all of our units about different approaches to, um, to diabetes care so they could be local experts. And then we, um, we developed, um, incorporated the evidence-based approaches to glucose management into our um, electronic um, medical record with the smart order set. So we were um, able to show, and again, this is the work of one of my former endocrine fellows that over the course of those interventions that the risk of um, hypoglycemia in the hospital significantly declined. And um, you know, so again, showing that um, with the, the policy and order set and other and educational um, programs that we were able to shift to a safer um, environment for patients with diabetes. And this will become relevant when I tell you how I ended up getting into the work I do now. So we were really excited that this work um, resulted in us winning um, a 2015 Johns Hopkins Hospital Innovations and Clinical Care Award. Um, subsequent to that, we were able to use that preliminary data to um, write a grant to the NIH to expand um, those um, successful programs throughout all of our hospitals um, at Johns Hopkins. So now all five of our adult hospitals um, use the same approach to glucose management. And I'm really I'm proud of my mentees who expanded that work. Um, and these are just sort of showing an example of the various um, thing, things that have been published since that original publication um, really um, focused on um, um, improving the care for patients with diabetes in the hospital. So I got um, promoted to professor in 2014, um, you know, based on, on that work. And, you know, it's funny, once you get promoted to professor, I don't know how it is at Case Western, we don't get tenure to full professor, just um, we don't get it at associate. So at that point, you're kind of like, okay, now what do I do now? Like, you know, um, I was still interested in science, but I felt like there, I wanted to um, really maybe make um, a, 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 an impact that impacted other people here more so, and not just my patients or, you know, or the individual scientific work I was doing. So when we get promoted, we get, um, you know, this nice fancy dinner. I think they've restarted those during COVID. And now that COVID is over, or, well, not over, but you know what I mean, like now that COVID isn't as prevalent. Um, and then with, with the women, you get a pen that tells you what number your promotion number is. So, you know, we, we, we know who the first woman professor was in the School of Medicine, and you get a number. And I was number um, 198. So this gentleman right here, Dr. Mark Anderson, was the new chair of medicine at the time. And he um, was looking for an executive vice chair of the department. Um, to really help him in leading the tripartite mission of the department. And I never thought about applying for a role like that, but my division chief encouraged me to, because he said, you understand research, you understand clinical operations, and you like to develop faculty and people. So, you know, I applied, and to make a long story short, um, you know, I went through the interview process and was selected to become the inaugural executive vice chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, so I thought maybe I might be going the department chair dean route, but then, um, about two months after I started, the Freddie Gray unrest happened in Baltimore. So Tina alluded to it in the introduction. Um, but, um, you know, so for those of you who don't remember, Freddie Gray um, died after um, several days after being um, arrested and held in police custody here in Baltimore City. And it really resulted in a lot of um, unrest. And, you know, I had to think back about the time of when was the last time that Baltimore was in that kind of turmoil. And it was the same time that my own home city of Washington, D.C. was in that turmoil. So it was right after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And I could not believe that here we were in Baltimore City with police and riot gear, again, like in my lifetime. Um, so it really, for me, was a flashback, sort of going back over the course of my whole life. I was born in the midst of that. And here I had a 15-year-old son who was witnessing this. So one of the things that the deans asked the department director to do when all of this happened was to bring faculty and staff together to talk about the issues that were at the root of the riot. Because it wasn't just that people were upset only about um, Freddie Gray's death, but they were upset about the economic inequalities, the ec educational inequalities. There were a lot of things. And a lot of our staff in the surrounding community work here in our hospital. So those of us who talked to them 
knew what the issues were. And what my chair said is, I don't wanna do something just to check off a box. I wanna do something that's sustained that'll make an impact on the department. And he asked me what we should do. And for the first time in 20 years, I started telling him my own story. I said, well, once I leave the protection of the Johns Hopkins Dome, um, it is sometimes terrifying for me to live as a black American. I said, you know, my son was 15 when Freddie Gray died. Um, this Easter picture was taken maybe like two weeks before um, the unrest happened here in Baltimore. And he had gotten his learner's permit and I was terrified for him to learn to drive. Not because he would have an accident, but because he'd be pulled over um, and perhaps killed without cause. Uh, my husband, um, Dr. Christopher Golden here is a neonatologist. He has to drive back and forth to the hospital in the middle of the night to take care of other people's sick children. And I'm terrified until I know that he's um, safely in the hospital. Um, and you know, my son had gone from this adorable little baby to like now he's like a fully bearded 23 year old. But I mean, you know, this whole thing about who looks threatening and the like. And I said, and then by the way, when I go in an expensive store, people like follow me around and keep asking me for help, even though I said I didn't need it because they've been doing that since I was 14 because they're assuming you're there to shop with. So I thought as a leader, I had to very honestly tell these stories, even though I was a faculty member here with tenure, an endowed professor, that my life outside of the dome was very different. And in fact, the concerns I had about my son were the same as the housekeeper that cleaned my office and the security guard that guarded our building because we talked about this after work because we were all the moms of black sons and my faculty-ness did not give me any cover for that. So we start, and then I thought back about, you know, what, um, when I was at the University of Maryland, I mentioned that I pledged Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. And one of the things that I, or these are my line sisters, clearly do not laugh at the 80s hair. We have evolved, as you can see from a more recent photo. But I show this picture because, you know, I thought our founders like stood up and they voiced things that were very uncomfortable and unsettling. Um, back in 1913, when it was very hard to do so, and I need to have the same courage to do that as well. So I felt like it was almost an Esther moment, you know, where it was like, you know, in the, in the Bible, you know, Esther, um, you know, the king had put out an edict based on Haman's wicked behavior to annihilate the Jews. And her cousin Mordecai came to her and said, you know, Esther, um, there's this plan to annihilate the Jews and don't think because you are in the king's house that you will be spared. And he said, perhaps you've come to kingdom, the kingdom for such a time as this to deliver your people. And then he said to her, but if you choose not to, the Lord will bring help from another place. So I was like, I hear the message loud and clear, as uncomfortable as this is, I'm, I'm not going to have help come from another place. I'm going to use my leadership role to be a voice. So what we ended up forming in the Department of Medicine was a civic engagement initiative. It started with a journeys and medicine um, seminar series that we held from May to June of 2015, right after the unrest happened. And we used it as an opportunity to explore how race and background inform our worldview and relationships, and also to strategize and develop an approach to improving our environment, building a culture of respect and improving our community. And um, it was a five part series where we talked about, so in addition to me sharing my experience, other um, trainees and staff of color shared their lived experience. We did implicit bias for all of our departmental leadership, so nursing, administrative, and physician leadership. We had a community panel. We invited community members to come in and tell us what it is they needed us to do to support them as opposed to us assuming that we knew. And we also had a panel on the relationship between the, um, our health system and the, and the community and their experiences when they came in to provide clinical care. So we used that information to launch the Civic Engagement Initiative, and this is what we learned that people thought it was important to heal the strained relationship between the police and the community. It was important that we engage in mentoring of people, young people in Baltimore City, that they wanted greater involvement of Hopkins employees in the surrounding community. They wanted us to share our research results with the community um, and then address the cultural differences within our organization to enhance those relationships and communication. So, um, so we did, we formed um, a tri-led um, civic engagement initiative um, that um, is still going on today. We redid our department mission and vision statement. Um, and we really um, did things to engage and, and to provide opportunities for our staff and faculty to directly engage in the surrounding community. And that work is summarized um, in an academic medicine publication. But I share all that to say that that's how I went from being a diabetes 
um, epidemiologist and health services researcher to being a chief diversity office officer. I did not go to medical school to do that. But then when I thought back about what um, I wanted to do in medicine, I realized that a role like this would actually bring together um, my love and concern for the, the internal and the external community. I could use my scientific background to really help think about data-driven approaches to DEI work. And then my operational background, I think about how do we need to change systems and policy, but instead of being around diabetes, it was around culture. So that, um, I said no three times, that's a whole nother discussion, maybe in the Q&A. So, so now I'm just gonna shift and sort of talk about the work that I've done in the, in the DEI space. Um, so this was a slide I thought was gonna pop up earlier. So I mentioned when we get promoted to professor, they tell us what number professor we are. We're up to like 344 um, full professor women in the School of Medicine since the medical school's inception. And so I was number 198. I was trying to make 200, but that didn't quite work out. But I was excited to be 198. But then when I looked at Black women professors in the School of Medicine, I was only number four in 2014. And the first, Dr. Lisa Cooper, a close friend and mentor, was the first was not until 2007. So even though we've made so much progress for women, for Black and Brown women, we were lagging behind. We are now up to, we are probably now up to close to 25 um, Black women full professors in the history of our um, organization. But again, this was very recent, 2007, you know, this, this century. Um, so if we begin to look at the double AMC data and we look at um, the breakdown by race and ethnicity, 5.5% um, of um, physicians um, in medical school faculty are um, Hispanic, 3.6% are African-American, less than 1% each Alaska Native and Native American and um, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. And only 2% um, of faculty in schools of medicine in the country are Black women. Um, and then if you look, um, divide it further by, um, by sex, then um, you know, Black and African-American women, among Black Af women, um, Black women make up more um, of school of medicine faculty um, compared to other races where men predominantly make up the faculty still. But if you look among full professors, among those who are Black, there's still more Black men professors than there are Black women professors. So even though we are there, um, fewer of us are getting promoted to full professor. And then these are just data, again, from the double AMC. And you can see um, that, again, um, just looking by um, diverse groups, um, full professors, um, you know, there's are less represented among the historically underrepresented in medicine groups compared to assistant professor um, and um, an associate professor. So again, um, seeing that disparity in women of color who get promoted to um, full professor. And then if you look at basic science chairs, department chairs, again, the majority um, of the women who are department chairs are white. Um, and that's true for basic science departments and clinical science departments. So not, not much diversity even among women among um, the chairs. So what are the reasons for this type of um, underrepresentation? So one is the very famous Flexner report that was published in 1910 that eliminated medical school as proprietary school and it established the biomedical model as the gold standard for medical training. Um, but it had racial implications because after um, uh, the Flexner report, many medical schools in the US closed and of the seven at the time that were open that were training future black physicians, um, the only two that were left um, were Howard Medical School and Meharry Medical College. And this was at a time where those who wanted to become black physicians couldn't gain access to predominantly white medical schools. Um, and then this was a study published in 2020 that tried to estimate if those five um, universities had been given the resources to live up to the biomedical model and had remained open along with Meharry and Howard, how many more physicians would they have trained? And they estimate they would have collectively trained an additional more than 35,000 um, graduates by 2019, which would have resulted in a 29% increase in the number of graduating Black physicians in 2019 alone. Um, and I say because there are many non-Black um, individuals that attend historically Black colleges and universities for medical training, the diversity of our medical landscape would have looked completely different. And then there's other reasons for the underrepresentation. So this was a National Academy of Medicine report that was published, um, I think in 2019, that showed that more than 50% of women faculty and staff report harassment, sexual harassment. Um, and women um, students, trainees, and faculty are harassed not only by colleagues, but by patients and patients' families. 
Um, and then if you look at women of color, compared to men of color, um, white men and white women, women of color are more likely to feel unsafe in an academic environment and more likely to experience verbal racial harassment. They're also equally likely as white women to experience verbal sexual harassment. And then Black, Asian, and Latino women are less likely to report sexual harassment compared to white women. So it doesn't mean it's occurring less, they're just less comfortable reporting it. And then what the impact of that is, is that they experience more mental health symptoms, so more symptoms of depression, stress, and anxiety, impaired psychological well-being, as well as somatic symptoms. Um, among Black women, cross-racial harassment is perceived as particularly more offensive, frightening, and disturbing than interracial harassment. So, you know, if you are a Black woman and you're harassed by um, a white male, that's going to make you feel more uncomfortable than if you were harassed by a Black male. And overall, for all women, this results in lower job satisfaction, which can lead to job withdrawal. Um, if you actually look at the, um, the status of women, um, it, there's only about... Um, 6% of advanced degrees in science and engineering um, um, have been awarded to underrepresented women. And then non-white women are underrepresented in the biomedical workforce among um, research grants and R01 equivalent NIH awardees. So, you know, again, more, more trouble um, in making that transition to the R01. And then overall, Blacks comprise only one and a half percent of the R01 applicant pool. Um, and if you look at all of the academic subspecialties, um, Hispanics and Blacks are underrepresented across more than 15 subspecialties. So that's sort of the causes. So then what are the consequences of the underrepresentation? Um, this is my favorite quote of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that says, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And that's because when people are ill, they're at their most vulnerable and we should be the most human, but that's not how things have always happened. Um, so there are multiple things that have contributed to, from the medical and scientific standpoint, that have contributed to health inequities. Um, so we know that during, um, and during slavery, it was not uncommon for slaves to be experimented upon um, without their consent, often without general anesthesia. So this is a very famous painting by, um, that shows Dr. J. Marion Sims, who's considered the father of modern day gynecologic surgery. Um, he invented the speculum, but he repeatedly performed his procedures on um, enslaved women, not only without their consent, but without general anesthesia. And this was at a time where ether was available as a form of anesthesia. So he was, um, he became the president of the American Medical Association. So no one saw a problem with what was really barbaric behavior. Um, and then there've been other, um, other things. So like um, here at Hopkins, we wrestle with um, the Henrietta Lack story and the fact that her cervical cancer cells were harvested to produce the HeLa cell line that's been used to advance science and medicine, but again, without her consent um, and without, you know, sort of um, involvement of her family um, in that. And then in addition to that, we've already talked about the Flexner report, but there was also eugenic theory um, at the turn of the last century that purported that there were certain race and ethnic groups that were inferior, biologically inferior to others. So those who were considered unfit were not only Blacks, but, um, but Jews, um, um, Eastern European immigrants and immigrants from Southern Italy. Um, and even though today we know that there's no um, scientific foundation to eugenic theory, this has resulted in residual healthcare provider bias toward minoritized patient communities, um, language and communication barriers. And then, you know, the trust of the of, of ma marginalized communities has been violated by the medical establishment and really needs to be earned back. And so um, that results in poor access to care. Um, and less equitable experiences of care, even when people get into um, our health system. So you may ask, like, what, what is um, unconscious bias? You know, so I've talked about this residual bias toward minoritized patients. So it's a tendency or an inclination that results in a judgment without question. Um, and often we, we're getting something like 11 million stimuli a second. So this enables us to, by making quick associations, it enables us to interact with our world in a safe way. But if those those quick associations are made in reference to characteristics about people, then that can become an, an unconscious bias. And it can often conflict with our conscious attitudes, behaviors, and intentions. And it's also important to recognize that biases may not only be held by individuals, but by groups and institutions. And they can have, they can be negative biases or positive biases, but they're gonna have consequences either way. And so, you know, in healthcare, we think well, as physicians, we are above all of that. And it turns out that we are not immune. Um, so physicians exhibit the same implicit biases as the general population. Um, they, we generally do not 
exhibit um, explicit race bias, but the impact of the implicit bias on our decision making can have consequences. So for decisions based on objective findings, so how many white blood cells to diagnose a urinary tract infection or a blood pressure cutoff or hypertension, there's no overall impact of implicit bias. But for subjective decisions and pain management is one of the most common. There is some evidence of implicit bias such that you know, patients, black patients often are underdosed on pain medications. They're assumed to be drug seeking, even when there's a valid reason like a sickle cell crisis or surgery. Um, and a lot of this may be residual. There was sort of this lie told um, during the time of enslavement that, well, they have a higher pain threshold. That's why we don't have to use anesthesia. So this is a residual bias that's left over. Um, we also know that physician, um, patient physician communication is more adversely affected when there's implicit bias. And if you control for actual education, physicians will still tend to rate black patients as less educated than comparable white patients. So that bias is there. So again, that kind of bias can then lead to you know, stressful experiences in the healthcare system, um, people um, not going, so they end up not being diagnosed with uh, hypertension, um, hypercholesterolemia, hyperglycemia, and that can lead to the disparities in, their, in these outcomes. And in addition, we don't have as much time to talk about this, but there are all the social conditions and policies that have contributed. So the former redlining and predatory lending practices in urban areas during the Great Migration, where African Americans leaving the Jim Crow South, unlike my grandmother, are pretty much relegated to certain areas of cities. And once that neighborhood became an all black neighborhood, there was a lack of economic investment, a lack of investment in the schools, a lack of investment in high quality jobs. So all of those then have led to communities that um, really have not been able to catch up, if you will. And then there was also discrimination and access to high quality jobs. So the New Deal legislation after World War II farm and domestic laborers were excluded. It's like my grandmother was a domestic laborer when she came up here. So then that, in addition, um, until the 1968 Fair Housing Act was signed into law, federal housing loans were refused to millions of not just Black, but Asian, Hispanic, Jewish, and immigrant families. That was through 1968. So um, again, all of these things, we know that where people live impacts their health. So that's how structural and institutional racism have led to neighborhoods with you know, a lack of um, stability and cleanliness, like no places to exercise, no green spaces, a lack of access to healthy food and affordable housing. Um, and again, all contributing to this higher risk of diabetes, obesity, and all of the consequences of those diseases. So what is the value proposition for diversity? Then why should we do this? And I love this quote. Um, it says, if what value diversity does is it facilitates friction that enhances deliberation and upends conformity. And you know, and I think for us in um, healthcare in particular, diversity and inclusion really is a matter of life and death because our decisions and our biases can adversely impact a patient's outcome. And you know, greater diversity leads to greater um, scientific impact. It leads to greater innovation in everything that we do. So um, you know, raising marginalized voices is not an attempt to suppress the others. It is an attempt to bring all the voices to the table so that we can be the most innovative and creative for patient outcomes. So I'm gonna take you through a really quick, what I call the Black Women Physicians Hall of Fame of women healthcare leaders who have inspired me in the, in the name of a Women's History Month and say like, why is it that we actually need that kind of intersectional creativity? So Dr. Rebecca Crumpler is recognized as the first um, Black woman in the US to earn a medical degree in 1864. The Civil War ended in 1863, so that kind of tells you the time at which she was functioning. Um, Dr. Rebecca Cole was the second Black woman to earn a medical degree, and she practiced for 50 years. Um, Dr. Eliza, so these were the first. Dr. Eliza Ann Greyer earned a medical degree in um, 1898, and she was the first Black woman licensed to practice medicine in the state of Georgia. And then um, not to um, around the same time, um, Dr. Hallie Tanner Dillon Johnson was the first woman of any race to practice medicine in Alabama. So not just the first black woman, the first woman period. Um, and then these are some other firsts. So Dr. Dorothy Lavinia Brown was the first black woman um, surgeon in the South. And she was the first fellow of the Ameri first woman fellow of the American College of Surgeons. Um, Dr. Alexa Kennedy um, was the first black female neurosurgeon in the US. I remember reading about her when I was um, thinking of applying to medical school. Dr. Rosalind Scott was the first black female thoracic surgeon um, in the US. 
Um, and then we have also had Black women in leadership. So Dr. Edith Irby Jones um, was the first woman elected president of the National Medical Association in 1985. So even though this was an all-Black physician organization, it had been all men leaders up until 1985. Um, Dr. Marilyn Hughes Gaston was the first Black woman to lead a public health service bureau and set up nationwide screening, newborn screening for sickle cell disease. Um, Dr. Dorothy um, Therabee is the medical director of the Mississippi Health Project during the Great Depression and really made an impact in the Mississippi Delta. Um, Dr. Um, Jocelyn Elders was the 15th Surgeon General of the U.S., and she was the first um, board-certified pediatric endocrinologist in Arkansas. Um, and she was our medical school graduation speaker, so um, I was, it was really a privilege to be able to meet her. Um, and then we've had other leaders um, in, um, among our Surgeon Generals, so Dr. Regina Benjamin, who was the 18th Surgeon General of the U.S., and then Dr. Audrey Forbes Manley was the first Black woman appointed as Assistant Surgeon General in 1988. Dr. Um, Vivian Penn was the first um, Black woman to chair an academic department of pathology in the U.S. Um, and that was at Howard University. And she was the inaugural director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, made a tremendous impact. And we are both alumna of the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Um, and then these are other women in leadership. So Dr. Barbara Ross Lee, who happens to be Dr. Diana Ross's sister, in case you didn't know, she was the first um, woman appointed dean of the U.S. Medical School, so the College of Osteopathic Medicine at Ohio University. Um, Dr. Um, Ivana Chris um, smith Deal um, was the first woman to chair the National Medical Association Board of Trustees. And then Dr. Joan Reed, who's also an inspiration to me, was the inaugural dean of diversity and community partnerships at Harvard Medical School. Um, Dr. Rosalind Epps, she was the first Black um, president of the American Medical Women's Association. Um, and then Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble chaired the Tuskegee Syphilis um, Study Legacy Committee in 1997, and her work led um, to the Clinton administration to apologize for the Tuskegee Syphilis experiment. Um, and then Dr. Um, Gertrude, um, Dr. Gertrude um, Hunter was the um, national director of the health um, services for um, Project Head Start. Um, she was a pediatrician, so really wanting to make sure that our children started out in the right place. Um, other women leaders, Dr. Renee um, Jenkins is the first Black president of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Society of Adolescent Medicine. Um, Dr. Paula Johnson created um, one of the first facilities in the country focused on heart disease in women. She's now the president of Wellesley College. And Dr. Risa um, Lavizo More was the first um, Black person and woman president and CEO of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which does a lot of funding um, around healthcare. Um, and then there were research pioneers. Um, Dr. Patricia Bath invented the laser on um, FACO, which is a device and technique for cataract surgery, and um, was the first woman to chair an ophthalmology residency in the U.S. And Dr. Jane Cook Wright developed new techniques for administering chemotherapy, and in 1967 was the highest ranking Black woman in any U.S. medical institution at the time. Um, and then Dr. Um, Helene Gale, she was the first director of the CDC's National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention, and she was also in a former um, assistant surgeon general. And then Dr. Mae Jamison, and I had her poster in my wall in my college dorm. She was a physician and scientist, um, but she was the first Black woman in space, first Black woman astronaut in space. So, um, so I, I just think it's important to know that, that history, and there is a young up-and-coming star, Jasmine Brown, who is a third or fourth year medical student at University of Pennsylvania, I forgot which, but she has um, turned her thesis work when she was a Rhodes Scholar into this book called Twice as Hard, the stories of black women who fought to become physicians from the Civil War to the 21st century. And I um, highly rec recommend that. So in the last second, I'm gonna try to whiz through this in five minutes so that we have time for discussion. So one question is, why is it important to have intersectionality? What can we as women bring? And then particularly, what can we as diverse women bring? And I just want to show you a few examples from COVID-19 because there were a group of us that came together. We saw what was happening to our communities and we were like, we cannot let this happen. So we formed um, our, the two biggest health systems in Baltimore, University of Maryland Medical System and Johns Hopkins Health System, worked together to form um, a community partnership. And within that, Johns Hopkins Medicine formed its own COVID-19 anchor strategy work group. Um, that was led by Alicia Wilson, who was previously our Vice President for Economic Development. And, um, and, um, and, and we worked with the Baltimore Public-Private Partnership between the two medical systems. So Nikki McCann, another um, outstanding woman leader, we pretty much led these groups to ensure that 
um, Baltimore City, particularly the vulnerable communities, were getting the things that they needed. So some of the things that we advocated for and were able to, um, our leadership was able to support us in doing was um, we had to use novel public health messaging campaigns. So um, our community listens to the NAACP, even if they don't listen to Johns Hopkins. So we helped to support and launch this um, sound truck that drove around the city basically in April of 2020 saying, please go back inside, wash your hands and wear a mask. And you'll notice Johns Hopkins name is nowhere on this, but because we wanted to be leading from behind, but making sure we were getting the message out in a way the community could understand. So you know, it was like the black women who knew how our community members think that said this was the best way to get the message out. Um, and then I was able to partner with our um, Latina um, sisters and, um, and really making sure that our language services support was adequate because we have a large um, immigrant population in Baltimore that are from, um, that are Hispanic. So um, Dr. Kathleen Page, who's one of our infectious disease doctors who's from um, Uruguay and is um, bilingual, um, helped support the Baltimore City Health Department and bilingual contact tracing, um, ED follow-up and meal delivery. And she also did a bi-weekly Ask Your Doctor on Facebook because people were getting misinformation from Facebook, so we wanted to put the right information out on Facebook. Um, our senior director, Tina Tolson, was, of Language Services, was very supportive. And Inez Stewart, who's our senior vice president for HR, who's Puerto Rican, also bilingual, um, was an executive champion to help take these ideas to um, the senior most leadership. Um, Kathleen also launched um, what we call the Juntos Consultation Service. So um, it, we were able to um, get um, bilingual volunteers, um, some of our physicians and nurses to round with the, on the COVID units and be able to um, translate, um, explain to the patients in their own language what was happening. So it's one thing to have a translator say you're about to be intubated. It's another thing to have somebody explain in your own language what being intubated means. They, um, they, they were also able to call their families and tell them in Spanish what was happening because at the time nobody could see their families in the hospital. Um, and then also um, we were an important part of advocating to have a COVID-19 testing site set up in uh, um, one of our church parking lots, which was a safe space in the community for our um, immigrant community. It had the highest COVID infection rates at 1.48%. Um, it was a hot spot. So we were able to convince um, our organization to support the COVID community testing and the flyers were done in both Spanish and English. And it was such a successful COVID testing site that later on, Dr. Page was never able to get support to turn it into a COVID vaccine site um, as well. So I think um, I may pause here, Tina, so people have time for questions, because um, we did a lot around COVID vaccine equity education as well, and maybe I could talk about that if people have questions, unless you want me to keep going. Um, yes, you can keep going, and if, if you guys have questions, feel free to jump in. Um, Okay, you can go ahead and finish. Okay, because um, I'm almost done. So I just wanted to show you again, this is like with the diverse voices at the table. Um, we realized when we started rolling out our vaccines that a lot of our employees said they wanted to hear from people that look like them about whether they should get the vaccine. These are people working in our organization. So we quickly got together on a Zoom. I recorded it from the computer in my basement and we basically created a YouTube listserv about all the questions about the vaccine. These were all vaccine experts in infectious disease who were able to really explain in ways that people could understand um, so that we could really give our employees the information they needed. Um, we also realized that a lot of our most important frontline staff who were being exposed, so environmental services, patient transport, um, security, they, they don't sit around and read emails during the day at Hopkins. They're out on the units working. So we needed to make sure they were getting information about the vaccine, how to sign up for the lottery. So we had posters made um, to put in their break rooms that had QR codes so they could scan and get all the information about the vaccines as well as how to sign up. And then for some employees where the computer was still a hindrance, we set up a call line in occupational services so they could just call um, and make their vaccine appointment and, um, and had a set aside for what we call the equity supply for those particular employees. So it really, I feel like if our voices hadn't been at the table, no one would have really recognized us. Everyone was receptive once it was brought to their attention, but they weren't the ones that had thought about it because the lived experience was different. Um, and again, we had a very large um, mobile community vaccine outreach um, across the DMV that Hopkins supported. Um, we vaccinated people in senior housing facilities, recreation centers, shopping centers, church basements, community centers. So 
instead of having them come to us, um, we went out to them. Um, and then we supported all of this again with, um, this was a, um, our COVID community education team that really, like we had to educate the community so then they would feel comfortable going to the mobile site. So we met every Friday for a year um, to make sure our communities were getting the right information. And you can see the diversity, a lot of diverse women at this table. Um, and again, you know, we created infographics and a, a, a toolkit because that's what the community told us they wanted. Um, we did webinars to support um, safe reopening of houses of worship in the spring of 2021. This was done in collaboration with the mayor's office. Um, so giving faith leaders that information, but then also um, we went to nine churches and some members of our team went out to those churches and showed them how to safely just set up the reopening. How do you um, do a baptism or a communion or a choir practice? And so really gave them hands-on um, consultation. Um, and then finally, you know, as much as we loved our beautiful Hopkins website, um, our folks were not necessarily listening to that. So most of the black community in Baltimore and the Maryland area listens to Urban One Radio and they read the Afro News, which is the oldest newspaper in the country, the black owned newspaper in the country. Um, and then the Hispanic community listens to El Temple. So we actually worked with our marketing and communications to pair us as clinical experts with trusted community messengers and these events were live streamed on Facebook. And they got so many share shares that we reached hundreds of thousands of people across the DC, Maryland area that we never would have if we used traditional modes. So we've done um, other programs. We just did a prostate awareness program, for example, with Urban One Radio during Black History Month. So we discovered that these new approaches were needed. So I think in all of this, I know for me, I felt like I was able to find my voice. Um, and realized that I felt like I was stuck between this pandemic and the civil unrest going on after, um, you know, George Floyd was murdered. But, at, you know, again, it was a chance to, to have another Esther moment and find a voice and really work with our state legislators in Maryland through our government and community affairs office to um, craft legislation, testify on behalf of legislation to support health equity in the state of Maryland. So we have a whole group. We have a Black Speaker of the House in Maryland. Um, but we have a whole like legislative group of um, um, legislators of color in Maryland who are really committed um, to equity. And, um, and these five bills um, were passed in the 2021 Maryland legislative session and will be um, enacted or being enacted in the state. And recently, I think we have a Trans Equity Maryland Act that has passed as well this particular session. So we really have tried to be um, a voice. So um, I just want to acknowledge my family who inspired me, my mom and dad who um, ensured that I knew all of my growing up um, that I needed to find my voice to support the community and keep their cause going. They lived through the first civil rights movement. I feel like I'm living through the second and uh, my husband and son who are a source of inspiration. So um, I think that was it. I can stop sharing if there's time for a few questions. Wow, wow. I give you, let's give her a round of applause, everyone. Dr. Hill Golden, what an outstanding presentation. You certainly have found your voice. We certainly appreciate your contribution to this academic space. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was absolutely wonderful. Wow. I want to open it up real quick for questions. If there are any questions in the chat, I certainly welcome Tracy. Um, Conley Jackson, our program manager, to share those questions. Um, or you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Well, I have a question. So real quick, before um, someone else jumps in, uh, with what's happening with the Supreme Court right now? What, what are your thoughts um, as to how we will, um, you know, the challenges that we will face as it relates to admissions uh, policies and procedures? And what does that look like for academic units, right, from a mm -hmm. DEI perspective and recruitment of underrepresented populations? Yeah, I think that's going to be very tricky. And actually, our, uh, our university, uh, you know, um, um, legal counsel, you know, has been thinking about this so that, you know, that we aren't caught off guard. Like one of the things that I know we're thinking about is how to, um, you know, ensure that um, the, so we, what we're trying to work on is we want to still accomplish the same goals with our programs, but how do we keep them from being flagged, for yeah. example. So 
and then um, making sure that it's included. Like um, one of our um, departments had a visiting clerkship for underrepresented students, but actually non-underrepresented students can, can come as well because, you know, um, there's different reasons why people might be marginalized. So for example, we think about race, but there's disability status, there's sexual orientation, gender identity, and there are invisible things that can't be seen. But what was interesting is somebody went on the website, pulled out the program and reported it to the Office of Civil Rights. But fortunately, we were able to go back and with data tracking show that what well, it's actually been, you know, we've had a mixture of underrepresented and non-underrepresented individuals come through the program. And we made sure that the checkoff box that asked about people's identity included, you know, white race as well. So I think that's one of the things, you know, that will need to be done. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's going to be um, extremely tricky in the higher education um, space because, you know, what's interesting is I forget I forgot the name of the group um, that is advocating about this, but but a lot of it, I think, particularly for Harvard came out of the concern that Asians were not being admitted as frequently um, as say black students or Hispanic students. When in fact, if you look at the demographics of the admissions, you know, at Harvard and other schools relative to the population, there was still, um, you know, there was still adequate representation of Asians. And I think one of the things that, um, that, that people need to think about is that at least in healthcare, Asians are underrepresented in leadership. Mm -hmm. so at some point, you know, I think all of the groups, like one of my, um, one of my, my program director has a funny saying, and she says, you know, we're not having an oppression Olympics. And I think it's really important for all marginalized groups to have a voice in this and for us to be unified in the same way. Yeah. Um, it makes sense in that pitting um, against one another, because all of this is, all of it hasn't come from just, um, you know, the dominant culture. Um, but I think it's going to be trying to spec your original question is trying to figure out, you know, if, if in like how you name a program, um, how you um, how you approach it. You know, I think that if you're not a state university and you have a donor that specifically wants, I want my funds designated for X, that's another way to think about how we engage in our philanthropy mm -hmm. and allowing donors to set up that gift contract to specify what they want it used for. Yeah. So I think that's gonna be another approach. Philanthropy is gonna be an important approach. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Other questions or comments? So you got, thank you very much. This was very comp uh, comprehensive and inspiring. Thank you for your interesting and inspiring talk. Thank you. I have another meeting by. <laughs> thank you for sharing your inspiring journey. Um, thank you for your journey and inspiring us to do better. Outstanding. Well, it's been, it's been a pleasure. And just remember all of our voices as women really do matter. We, we, yes. we actually think about things that others don't. And um, you know, bringing that to the table is really critical. Yes, yes, it is. You said something in your talk um, that was that just stood out for me. You said after 20 years of being at Johns Hopkins, um, you hadn't shared your story, your personal journey, right? And then after Freddie Gray, you know, you shared that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I think I sort of was raised in the generation of, um, and you can figure out my age because I had my birthday up there pretty, pretty big letters, but <laughs> I was kind of raised in the generation of, um, you know, just do your work, keep your head down, like this is all going to sort of pass over. I mean, it's very interesting when I started elementary school, you know, that's when integration has started. And, you know, if I think about like my son's generation, how active they are. I mean, in the 80s, when I was in high school, like junior high, high school and college, I mean, there wasn't a lot of, they had challenging things going on like there are now. I mean, it's like, you know, people were starting to make advances. Like when I was in college, everybody um, you know, everybody was fairly like receptive. I yeah. mean, we were yeah. the Michael Jackson era, like everybody was even dancing to the same music. So, yeah. you know, that, that activism, you know, probably while it was always there, like there, there wasn't necessarily a need for that. And so when I came to Hopkins and medicine is very conservative mm -hmm. or has been conservative.
lucrative. So it's like, well, we're only going to talk about healthcare here. We don't need to talk about these other things. But then, okay, you're expecting people to come to work and you don't realize that maybe on the way to work, they got pulled over. And the reason that they're not on their game today is because they got pulled over coming here. Right. So then it be, I, I can't really separate those experiences anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, and there was a sort of feeling of being overly sensitive in those things. And I think after 2020 in particular, I think every marginalized group is finding their voice. And I think it's it's becoming difficult for people that aren't used to hearing that in certain um, work sectors to accept that. Yeah. But that's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and even as we were thinking about our workforce reentry, um, you know, as COVID was improving, if it's really not gone, but you know, as we were able to live with it. And it was like, okay, how do we bring the workforces that have been out of the office for two years begin to bring people back into hybrid? Yeah. So the one of the things I kept making is the workforce that left is not the same one that's coming back. Mm-hmm. And certainly mm-hmm. the generation behind mine, like my son, my son is 23. I mean, none of them are silent and they have a lot of strong allies with them who are not silent either. So it, right. it's just interesting to see how healthcare evolves as, you know, there's definitely, I feel like I'm stuck between two generations. Yeah. And I agree with you um, because your, your son is experiencing it of quite differently than you. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And even though you were closer to the generation where the Africa, where the, the, those movements were, I'm in that generation as well. I'm in, I was born in 67. So I, mm-hmm. I get that. I get it. I think we have a question. Um, I'm interested in conducting research to mm-hmm. uncover unconscious bias at our institution and would like to eventually publish the work, but have concerns about how it will be received by institutional leadership. Um, any recommendations on how to approach this kind of research without appearing to air out our dirty laundry? Right, got it. This comes up all the time. And they even will have to have a um, review IRB applications. And we're like, well, the data or the data. So I think what I would suggest is um, definitely having like your IRB review. And then I think the key is to think about based on what you uncover, what interventions would you do? Um, You know, so there's always, there's like a next step. So even though, yes, you know, we have this issue, then it's like, um, but how we're going to develop interventions to address it are these things. Right. Um, Hopkins, we had to sort of air some dirty laundry. I was a resident then, but it was a JAMA publication by Linda Freed in 1996 that showed that our women were not getting promoted to professor in the Department of Medicine. Like there was just a lag, like this serious lag and a whole big gap. And, but what that did is it was able to lead to the development of like the Women's Task Force, a whole set of policies to support women in the department around promotion. So one of the things is to is to say that it's not just a matter of uncovering it for the sake of uncovering it to have a publication, but uncovering it so that we can then develop interventions that are going to make everybody successful. Right. Yeah. Thank you for that. We're concerned about institutional reputation, but you know, in some senses, the outside community and those who are on the receiving end, they already know what our dirty laundry is. So if we <laughs> take a data-driven approach to it, yeah. Um, nobody be surprised let's just put it that way people won't be surprised what they will like to see though is and here here are some um you know interventions what we're going to focus on now that we know this we're going to develop a program around you know xyz yes i agree with you 100 percent. and and that's um one of the things um that said um that the diversity work is data-driven right is data-driven period and so when we do those surveys that is going to air some some dirty laundry, if you will. And I don't know if it's dirty laundry, but it's our issues that we need to lift. And mm-hmm. it's out there, right? It's out there in our communities and our systems. And now is the best time to lift it and address it. So thank you for that question. Thank you for that. Other questions? We have a few more minutes and I know we have to let you go, but this has been great. We really appreciate your um, contribution. It is amazing. I think that we are, the the work has advanced, right? And that we can have these conversations. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, 
Well, again, Dr. Sharita Hill Golden, on behalf of Case Western Reserve University, I just want to thank you so much. You have been a great inspiration to me. You all, when I started in this um, in the School of Medicine, I began to research different institutions, and um, I ran into uh, Dr. Uh, Hill Golden, and I was so impressed with the work that she's doing around even the listening sessions that you guys provided for the community when this when we were at the height of uh, difficulty and 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 um, just people were stressed about coming to work and they were and so I wanted to sort of model that work here right how do we provide safe spaces for people to unpack and to say that I'm not okay right and so you provided that for for me and for many of us here to sort of model that behavior and providing safe space for people to to share their discomfort. Um, here's a question here. It says, what are some of the things young professionals in medicine and their daily work can do to advance our cause to improve representation and inclusion? Very good question. Yeah, no, that's a great one. You know, I think one of the things is, um, you know, the, the younger generation of say like our students and our trainees and residents um, are more, uh, tuned into a lot of the issues. So I think one of the things is, particularly among your peers, when you hear somebody make a comment that's um, not appropriate, um, is um, say, I'm sorry, help me understand what you meant by that. Um, because as opposed to, sometimes you might wanna say, oh my God, I cannot believe you said that's a dumb thing. You know, that's gonna put them on a defensive, but by saying, help me understand what you mean by that, because even that just begins to shift the environment. So people begin to think um, before they speak. So I think about that with inclusion, because if I think if it's anything, even even at this stage of my career with accomplishments, sometimes I'm like, okay, I have to go to this dinner after work. Am I going to experience a microaggression? Am I going to have to explain something I don't want to explain? Like it sometimes will actually influence my decision whether to go somewhere. Um, you know, so I think um, the representation um, is important, but we got to make sure the environment creates a place where people can be their authentic selves. So I think those are some of the things. Um, and um, and then I also think that, um, you know, making sure that you can advocate in your medical school curriculum or your graduate school, your training curriculum to um, make sure, and your residency curriculum to make sure that the issues around equity, what are evidence-based interventions, how do you address health equity, all of those things, make sure that they're incorporated into your curriculum. Because believe it or not, all the deans are afraid of you um, when you're in training because, you know, you can say things on surveys that, you know, yeah. you, you can be honest on surveys and say, well, no, I'm not getting any training in, you know, in health equity around um, particular populations. So I think that you can advocate. Like our students have pointed out some things in our curriculum that needed to be changed. And mm -hmm. we were able to, you know, have a consultant come in and work with us and have some of those faculty re-report certain lectures. And for people that faculty that didn't want to be a part of that, um, they're no longer directing courses. Mm. So you as a young person have a lot of power um, over, you know, stating what it is that you want to be included in your um, in your um, your education and training. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we wanna thank you once again. Everyone, please feel free to complete your survey. We've sent out, we would like your feedback regarding this dynamic session. And again, we wanna thank you for your time, Dr. Shahil Golden. I really appreciate you um, being with us and we look forward to having you again sometime. Oh, that's great. Hopefully we can see each other in person. <laughs> yes, yes. I hope I, I may be there next month. I'm not sure um, for the 13 school consortium meetings. Okay. Thank you again and bless you. Esther, you sure have found your voice. <laughs> okay, bye-bye everyone. Thank you all for coming.